Hello everyone, uh, my name is Steve Jordans. I'm a professor of psychology from University of Toronto Scarborough um, and, and I've recently you know, had some experiences around this issue of, of onboarding AI, I guess we would say, you know, bringing AI into our education system in a way that kind of, um, well, <laughs> reduces the overall stresses and such that, that are going to be there no matter what. So I, I've given some talks and, and they've been kind of well received and it's kind of helped me organize my thoughts around this a little bit. Um, and I think you're having a session today where you're going to be brainstorming and thinking through guidelines and approaches and such. And, you know, maybe these ideas will help you to kind of think through things a little bit. And so I was going to create all the slides, all that kind of stuff, but I thought, why not just be human and, and why not just chat? And I'll, I'll put up a few things. There's really like three points. So I'll highlight these three points. The first point I want to talk about is just the, the context in which this is happening happening and how important it is for us all to understand really the the mental health challenge that AI is causing, um, especially for teachers. Uh, so we want to kind of talk about that situation so that we, you know, really understand how difficult this is for, for many people uh, and that we keep that in mind when we're trying to navigate through this successfully. So with that context set, I'll then expose you to two ideas. One I will call the bridge of wonder, um, and the other one I will call the, the concept of intrapreneurship. Uh, and these are just two ideas that, that seem to have resonance from other educators I've spoken with. Uh, and again, they, they may be ideas you wanna consider and, and banty around a little bit as, as you think through things. Okay, so let's start with the context and, and let's just start with, I mean, the pandemic, right? If we imagine the pandemic and, and the amazing challenge that it brought to teachers, you know, basically all of our worlds were turned up on our head. We're expected to retool, learn different ways of interacting. Uh, and so that was very stressful. Now, and, and we're doing that professionally in, in a personal life that's very stressful, right? Where, our, where we can't really socially connect the way we want to, where we have this worry of a disease that's out there, et cetera. You know, all the stresses that came with COVID, the divisiveness in society that kind of came with it. And then you have teachers, you know, really having to kind of step up to a challenge and a challenge that lasted for years, right? And so, you know, we start to come out of that after experiencing chronic stress. Many teachers are feeling burnout um, and exhaustion. And it's in this context that, you know, this AI wave comes. And there's no doubt it's here and there's no doubt it's staying. You know, just as, as we're as we're talking about. Uh, and so it's something we all have to deal with. Um, but wow, is it ever hard for a lot of people to deal with it? And it's hard for a few reasons. One is that exhaustion that I've already talked about. But the second part is the whole mysteriousness of it. It's a hard thing to get your head around. And, you know, if you're as a teacher being asked to bring AI into your classroom, well, that means you have to first of all kind of understand what it is and then how to harness it effectively in the classroom and how to kind of manage this all with a group of students who maybe know the AI better than we do. Uh, and so it really hits at two primary psychological parts of us, our autonomy. This is something that's happening to us, not sort of by our will. Um, so we're just being forced to, to live with and, and figure out AI. And the second is our competence. You know, because we don't understand it so well, we feel less competent in the classroom. And those two are two of the three important ingredients of, of human intrinsic motivation. This is what makes us enjoy our job. And, you know, to, to have two of those disappear, the job gets a lot harder. Okay, so... So those are the things we want to try to think about too, competence and autonomy as, as we think through things um, and, and try to understand some potential solutions. If solutions is too strong a word. It's just, you know, what is the best path? How can we get from the situation we're in now to one where at least many, if not all teachers are comfortable using AI as part of their practice? 
Okay, so let's get to the ideas now. There's two ideas. Now, the first idea that I call the bridge of wonder, That's this is really a description of my own sort of journey here. You know, when AI came out at first, what I could first see was all of the things it was destroying. And the classic example that I give for that is the, the issue of writing from scratch, which was a tool that educators like us have been using for how long, <laughs> you know, since the written word almost, um, to try to encourage our students to think logically, to structure their ideas, to find their voice. You know, there was so much that potential that came from learning how to write from scratch. And suddenly with AI, that's maybe gone. You know, it, it may simply be very uncommon for anybody to write anything from scratch. We may almost always have the AI produce a draft and then we do our thing with the draft. Um, and so that may be a new way of, of doing things. And if it is, writing is dead. As an educator, that hurts, right? That's one of the tools in your tool belt. And we don't have that many tools. And, and when tools get plucked away from us, we start to feel like, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to teach in the classroom? That's the competence thing. How do you get from that fear and, and that discomfort of having things you, you know and like and feel comfortable about taken away? Well, you have to start being able to see that the opportunity that AI provides, you know, yes, old practices may be dead, but there may be new opportunities um, that AI can support in the classroom if we can start to think through what it does and how we can harness it pedagogically. But how do we get there? You know, when we're all burnt out, when we're all tired, and now we have this thing that we have to deal with, and we feel maybe more fear and exhaustion than anything else, how do we start to see the opportunity? And for me, that bridge between fear and opportunity was through wonder. Okay, it was through quite honestly playing with the AI in non-professional contexts. Um, so I started using AI to help me write lyrics to songs. It's something that, that I um, like to do for a hobby for fun is create songs. And my goodness, I was stuck on one song and I, I kind of told it what I had in mind, but I was kind of stuck and I said, can you just give me th two verses, a chorus and a breakdown section? Boom, there it was. And I'm looking at it and it's like, not excellent, but pretty darn good. You know, I had that first draft of a song that I could now work with. And I was amazed at how good that first draft was. Um, and then I started playing it with it in all sorts of other contexts. So for example, if you ever have a, a dinner party and let's say there's all these constraints of people coming, this person's a vegetarian, that person can't have onions, uh, whatever it may be, you can go to, to one of these AI systems and just say, hey, I'm having this dinner party, having this many people over, I'd like something that's not too difficult to cook. Oh, and by the way, here are the constraints. Can you suggest to me some options and recipes for those? Those options. Boom, it will, right? Wow. And so when you start to play with it in context like that, and, and what I'm really going to recommend to, you know, boards and, and, and schools is that they have wonder days, you know, they have events where people are just going to come and get hands on with AI, but not in an educational context, just in a real life context and, and preferably kind of cool, fun things, right? And as they do those cool, fun things, what, what's happening is two things are happening. One is the AI is becoming demystified, right? All of that, what is this thing? Well, you're starting to see what is that thing. You're starting to get a sense of the kinds of tasks it can do and the kind of tasks it can't do. I mean, that set's getting smaller every day, but you know, you're getting that sense. And so as you get a little more familiar with it, you know, a lot of our fear is based in ignorance. And as we lose that ignorance, we tend to lose the fear. And you know, as we play and see what it can do, then this starts to open our minds to opportunities. Like what are um, some potential things we could do with this that we couldn't do otherwise? Okay, and I'm gonna give you one taste. I like to give you one concrete example that came from my thinking, and there's, there's a few. We are now using AI to help 
students learn human communication skills. We're using AI to give really good formative feedback in a way that allows the teacher to be on the student side of learning and, and the robot to give the, the constructive feedback. But just to give you one other explicit example, um, one of the things I'm most excited about is we're going to try to create something called HAL a bot or collection of bots that do a holistic assessment of learning. We started to think, hey, you know what? Things like standardized testing, the reason we don't really like standardized testing is because of the testing and because of what the test is sensitive to and especially what the test is not sensitive to. You know, if you spend a lot of time building, say, 21st century skills through activities in your classroom, is that going to show up when your students do the test? Are you going to see that? Is the test sensitive to all of the things that we think are important that we're doing in the classroom? And I think for most of us, the answer would be no. And that's why we don't like it. We feel like we have to teach down to the test, that the kind of teaching we do that allows our students to excel on those tests is not consistent with the kind of teaching that we think is, has the most value to it. Um, but what if we could get the tests right? Okay, and with AI, so I, I always say there's this is example, I think of the British example, the way things used to work in Britain, um, I don't know if they still do, but if you want to learn about some topic, you want to learn about human memory, somebody says, okay, here's a bunch of books, here's a bunch of things I want you to go through, off you go, disappear, do your best learning, come back, and when you come back, I am going to basically cross-examine you. I am going to ask you a bunch of questions. I might ask you to do certain things. I might ask you to present your perspective, your own personal perspective on some, say, scientific debate or something like that. And by, by sort of coming at you in many directions and trying to assess your skills, your attitudes, your knowledge, your etc., we could perform a more holistic assessment of learning. Now, you can't do that if you require a human to do the interrogation every time. It just doesn't scale. But with an AI bot, um, you know, created well and, and tested for bias and all that kind of stuff, we could potentially have a better form of assessing learning. And I claim that if we could get that right, that would support more innovative practices in the classroom because those innovative practices would show up on the test and be rewarded. Okay, so I just throw that out there as an example that we're working on in my lab, but as an example of seeing a potential now that was impossible before AI. Uh, and once you start getting there, once you start thinking that way, now you're on the path of leaving the fear, moving towards the opportunity, and that's really important. Okay, so wonder sessions. That, that's my first idea. Try to instill that wonder. Try to demystify and have people sort of understanding how the AI works better. Okay. Second idea. Um, and this is more of a system level idea. You know, if you're a board and, and you're tasked with this question of how do we onboard AI into our classrooms, when you look at your teaching body, you're probably going to find that the vast majority of them are more in that fear place right now. Um, they're not looking forward to the whole issue of diving in and learning what AI is and harnessing it and trying this and trying that. But you have a subsection of students, or sorry, teachers, that are that. They are more like the entrepreneurs. They are people thinking about opportunity right away. Oh, this is interesting. What if I could do that? What if I could do that? Um, and those people, the suggestion is, if you can organize those people, give them the structure and the support and the freedom that they need to experiment with different approaches in the classroom. You tell them, hey, try using AI. And maybe these classrooms are, have a special designation. And maybe even students are informed, hey, when you take that class with that designation, that's going to be a teacher who's trying stuff. Some of that stuff won't work. And for this process to work, it's very important for you to understand and for them to understand, the teacher, that when you try out new things, they fail. This is an entrepreneurial mindset, right? You try it, you see what happens. If things fail, that's fine. You learn from every failure, you reshape, you retool, and it takes a special kind of teacher to be able to do that, right? They have to see the opportunity really strongly. They have to want to get there to the point where they're willing to accept 
this bumpy process to get there. And if the students are on board, then the process isn't nearly as bumpy um, because they know this is this becomes a fun, right? Students are learning about a sort of entrepreneurial approach. There's part of the solution to the problem. So my notion is if you could get that small, smallish group and empower them as your intrapreneurial team, sort of entrepreneurial mindset, but inside your system, inside your traditional system. That's the entrepreneurial idea. Um, and, and their ultimate goal over time is to produce very concrete use cases that can then be passed on to the other teachers where you could say to this teacher, hey, listen, you don't have to learn everything about AI. You don't have to come up with ideas how to use it. But here's something I think you'd like. I know you value, I don't know, scientific literacy. Here is a uh, module you could bring into your class that uses AI in a very specific way to teach your students about scientific literacy and, and to teach them about working with AI. Here's how it works. Here's what you have to do. Here's what's going on behind it. You know, once you empower the students, uh, the teachers, and especially if you give them a menu of these things, right? If you give them a menu of options and they say, oh, I like that one. Well, now you've got autonomy, right? Now it's their choice a little bit more. Yeah, I want to pick that one and use that. And if it's um, described in a concrete enough way, then they are going to feel competent. Okay, I know what this is doing. I get it. I understand it. I can explain this to students. I can still be the authority around this activity um, because it's constrained enough that I feel good. I feel competent. Okay, and so that's what the sort of entrepreneurial, intrapreneurial process could be. They do the messy work um, and then they help import these much cleaner use cases to the rest of the system, um, helping to onboard the, the, the teachers who just don't have the, the mental bandwidth to deal with that chaos, right? Cool. All right, so that's really all I have for you to, to kind of help you think a little bit. Um, I'll just, you know, re, re, just sort of bring this all together and say, you know, the first thing I think we all have to understand is we're human beings here. The robots are at some level already attacking. You know, the robots are making our life difficult. We cannot lose the humanness. We can not forget how tough a time this has been. We have to have a lot of res mutual respect. And, and connection with our colleagues. And, and when, they, when they're telling us, I, I just can't take that next step, we have to um, A, respect that, and B, try to come up with a way where, you know, if a step does have to be taken at some point, we make that step um, as comfortable as possible, which means we, we think about their autonomy, you know, we try to give them some choice of how they want to bring it into their classroom, and we try to feed the competency by giving them something that's very clear to use. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, and, and that combined with the Wonder Days, I skipped the Wonder Days. So, you know, in the context of Wonder Days where they're starting to see what these, these technologies are and it gets demystified, for me, that's, that's I think, currently the best approach. Take it for what it's worth. I'm, I'm just one dude who's trying to absorb some of this stuff and think, you know, what would I do if I was in a position of trying to, to, to bring a board along in this world? I hope some of these thoughts are useful, if only to provoke thoughts in yourself. Um, I wish you guys the best of luck. This is a very, very difficult task you're taking on. And I thank you for being willing to take it on. You know, you're probably already in that sort of entrepreneurial group I talked about. So fantastic. Good luck with your deliberations and have a great day.